Welcome everyone. My name is Sierra Sanchez, webinar producer with CGLR. The webinar will begin shortly and will be recorded. Connect with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading on social media. On Facebook and LinkedIn, follow us at Campaign for GLR. And on Twitter, follow us at Reading by Third. Please use the hashtag Learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learn from today's webinar, and we'll be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. Once again, the webinar will begin shortly. It will be recorded and shared with you afterwards. Okay, before we begin, I just wanted to share a few housekeeping details. First, we would love for you to introduce yourself. So please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city, or state, and your organization. Be sure when responding to select both panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. The webinar is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. A link to the recording as well as any resources, slides, and bios will be shared in a follow-up email to all who registered. We will also be posting a brief on-screen evaluation during closing and highly encourage you to respond. This helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement. And before we start, I wanted to call your attention to our upcoming webinars. Next week on the 21st, we hope you'll make plans to join us for an exciting doubleheader, which will begin with a funder to funder conversation focused on engaging philanthropic leaders in a conversation about the vital early learning workforce. This will be followed by a 3 p.m. conversation, which will take an in-depth look at brand new data from Gallup and a report called Deflation, How Good Grades Can Sidebind Parents. Registration links and information for these sessions will be posted in the chat box now, and we hope you can join us. And joining you now is Hattie Miles Polka, Senior Consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Welcome everybody to today's session, co-sponsored by Early Learning Nation Magazine, entitled Leaps and Bounds, How Early Learning Supports the Mississippi Miracle. As I've been reflecting on today's topic and the panelists that you'll hear from, the word that continues to come to my mind is inspiring. The work of our speakers, their colleagues and partners, and all those in the education and pediatric health sectors in Mississippi who have contributed may seem miraculous as the headlines would like us to believe, but any single conversation with one of these leaders would immediately dispel this misnomer. The amount of work, collaboration, intentionality, and continued sustained effort is astounding, and it has truly paid off. In past GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars, we've featured the work in Mississippi, talking about improved reading scores, uh, tutoring, coaching, professional development, and most recently in last week's session, actually, retention practices. Today's conversation is going to bring in a little bit of a different angle, and we're going to reflect on the role that early learning efforts have played in the state's ongoing success and improvements in reading proficiency, especially as we think about the transition from pre-K to kindergarten and kindergarten and beyond. I won't give away too much because I want to let our moderator provide a bit more context and our panelists to share their own perspectives, but wow, am I excited that we are lifting up the state's work. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists before passing the baton off to our moderator. And as a note, we'll be sharing the link to the speaker bios in the chat shortly. We are joined today by Dr. Jill Dent, Executive Director of the Office of Early Childhood at the Mississippi Department of Education. We also have with us Dr. Ruth Patterson, who is Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And finally, we're also joined by Dr. Tanette Smith, who is the Executive Director of Elementary Education and Reading at the Mississippi Department of Education. And now I'm very happy to introduce our moderator, Michaela Tatum, who is the Director of Early Childhood Policy at Mississippi First. Michaela, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Hattie. Um, First, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for coming and showing an interest um, in Mississippi. That really warms my heart, and I think sometimes we're left out of national conversations, so I'm really happy to see that we're not um, going to be. But basically, I wanted to start this conversation by talking about Mississippi Miracle and that term, which many people, including myself, find to be a little bit offensive. Um, 
many of you probably know that it was not a miracle, but hard work. And it took about 20 years to get here. Um, and it took a lot of intentional federal and state policy changes to get here and a lot of hard work from teachers, principals, and everyone else, interventionists, I don't want to forget anyone, to get to this point. Um, and Mississippi, especially um, in 2013, really started to do some intentional work uh, to get us to this point. And so I want, especially as it relates to early childhood, and so I think it's really important to start this off by saying that learning starts as soon as a child is born uh, and not in kindergarten. And I think that that's a really important um, point that I want everyone to keep in mind as we go through this um, panel today. So I'm going to go ahead and invite the speakers online and then we'll get started. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm going to start with Dr. Smith. Um, can you share a bit about the literacy landscape in the state prior to 2013 and that watershed moment of uh, three education um, bills passing? Did it again. <laughs> Mute. Um, good, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, when I started at the Mississippi Department of Education in 2013, um, Mississippi was uh, considered like your poor country cousin, right, by our sister, fellow sister, Southern state. Um, they were, it, there was always the phrase that was um, bandied around, thank God for Mississippi, at least for not them. Um, and so when I think our legislators, um, Senator Gray Tollison, they really took that to heart as they started to look at what they could do to build a comprehensive uh, support or comprehensive plan for helping Mississippi um, get to a place that nationally would not be at the bottom. Um, so we, within the comp in 2013, we had the Literacy Based Promotion Act that was passed. Um, we also had, um, a, not shortly after that, or maybe shortly before, um, the Early Learning Collaborative Act, um, which was also passed. And we had dyslexia therapy legislation that was passed around the same time. So there were multiple pieces of policies that were put in place that were really that acted as building blocks. Um, our Early Learning Collaborative really sat at the, as the foundation for anything that we were getting ready to try to uh, conquer as far as literacy was concerned in the K through three realm. Um, in 2013, when we started, we were an F with quality, quality counts. Uh, we were 50th in the nation um, for national uh, rank, ranking on quality counts. Um, our NAEP scores in 13, we, we were ranked 50th uh, for fourth grade reading. And um, we had about a 75% graduation rate. And we knew that all of this these outcomes were um, a product of what happened prior to a kiddo entering elementary school. Because our kiddos were entering um, pre-K and kindergarten multiple grade levels behind, that there, there was this hamster wheel of people really working hard trying to get us um, at the same level nationally. Um, so uh, I agree with you, Michaela. We this has been a multi-year uh, marathon, not a miracle, um, nor is it a mirage. We have had many naysayers who said that our, you know, our Miss the Mississippi scores are, you know, doctored or whatever. Um, Dr. Carrie Wright has always said to us as we were um, going through this that um, every data point, every percentile rank. Uh, those are children. Those data points are a kid. And if we think, keep the kiddo in mind as we are progressing, then we should be able to see some type of, of true progression. So in 2009, we had about 22% of our kiddos reading um, on, at fourth grade on level. By 2020, 2019, 32%. And um, we continuously saw uh, this growth and as we were going through um, providing supports and, and trying to grow the state by 2020, um, 2022, we were ranked 
we were we were ranked 35th for quality counts. We moved up from 50th for our fourth grade reading scores to 21st, right? Um, and increased our uh, graduation rate to about 88.9. And we've closed that, you know, we had an honesty gap. We were looking at assessments that were not truly, you know, assessing what our kid knew in Mississippi. And so we we had an F rating in that honesty gap. And so we've closed that honesty gap so that our assessments are truly aligned to what we expect a kiddo to know um, by the time as they reach the end of a particular grade level, whether it's kindergarten all the way up to third grade. Thank you for that. And I also want to thank you for speaking about the NAEP scores and, you know, how that's is talking about the NAEP scores and how those sort of led to this entire conversation about the Mississippi Miracle. Um, I kind of want to turn to Dr. Dent and ask her a question about the initial years of her um, work in early childhood, because as you mentioned, Dr. Smith, there, you know, kids were coming in behind. And so I'm curious, um, after the Early Learning Collaborative Act of 2013 passed, um, how did, how, what did that look like? Um, and what did the funding also look like? Because I know that that was a major barrier to implementation. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the funding component was really very interesting. Um, it was built into the Early Learning Collaborative Act and it started out at 2150 a child plus the programs also had to put up a one-to-one -one match. So um, we were looking at a $4,300 dollars per child, which was the Southeastern average at the time. Um, we have since gone up uh, to 5,000, uh, so $2,500 per child with state funding, and there's a component of the match as well. Um, so, you know, having that funding is, is really important, but the other side of that is the community has to buy in. Um, with these programs, you know, um, they have to be able to work in their communities with their Head Start entity, as well as childcare, if they're in, you know, if they're so inclined to do that. And we really um, encourage that in their community. Um, but as this legislation was written with help from Mississippi First, um, the near benchmarks were embedded in this component, which, you know, really sets up when you think about um, the whole child initiative and building on um, making sure that that child is ready to go into kindergarten and ready to learn in kindergarten. So um, in 2013, um, we were funded at $3 million. Uh, you know, we would go a few years with $3 million, and then we went up a little bit more and um, a few years later to $4 million, and then up a little bit more to 6 and 7 And then in um, 2020, everything changed. Um, Mississippi um, had uh, the legislature passed um, the bill for lottery implementation in Mississippi, which was amazing. And with that implementation, um, they created a plan to lay out the first $80 million um, was committed to roads and bridges. And then the rest of the proceeds went to education. So of course the legislature gets to decide how that's built out, but now we are funded at $24 million and only seven of that is general funds and the rest of it is lottery proceeds. Um, and I think all of the Literacy Based Promotion Act funding is lottery proceeds now. Um, no, we still have a little bit of general funds. You do? Um, like half and half, yeah. Oh, okay, good, good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the legislature is bought in. Um, they see the gains. They see the investment. They believe in the investment, especially with the community mm -hmm. having to put in a uh, um, component of match as well. Um, so, you know, the other piece of this with the funding is once our collaborative programs in, in our local areas are, are funded, as long as they meet the requirements, they um, continue to be funded. They, it, this is not a short-term grant, it's a long-term grant 
Um, and so, you know, they have to maintain good status in their grant, but they continue to receive funding, which is a game changer because otherwise programs would have to scrape to find title dollars or some other kind of grant funding to be able to offer those programs because the financial component with, you know, different funding streams throughout the school system is just not there. And so, um, you know, I think that um, this is a, a smart way for us to fund this program and um, our lottery program is strong and successful. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be successful for many more years to come. Exactly. Um, so, <laughs> so we've started with elementary education. We've gone down to like early childhood in particular pre-K. And now we're going to switch a little bit. And so I'm going to ask Dr. Patterson, um, who focuses on child development um, and a number of other things in your early childhood work, um, what were some of the initial focus areas for change and improvement? Uh, thank you so much for including us in the part of the conversation. The first statement to remember is that we cannot separate early childhood education from early child health. And so our focus was to actually uh, go out into the community and make, to make sure that the children were prepared to enter these early educational programs, prepare from a developmental standpoint, because you know, uh, where the child is mentally, physically, and developmentally directly determines how well they'll be able to learn once they're in an educational system. So just like we were at the bottom of the you know roll for um, some of our educational markers, we were also at the bottom of the roll for us as healthcare providers actually uh, screening uh, our children for developmental problems. So we were a part of a HRSA grant, uh, um, Health Resources and Services Administration grant that uh, charged us to improve the developmental and behavioral health of the children. And we took it from three perspectives. First of all, we wanted to make sure that all of our children were appropriately receiving formal developmental screening uh, wherever they were getting uh, child services. So um, we made sure that we went out to healthcare providers and um, educated them or reiterated what the Academy of Pediatrics recommendations were for screening, made sure that they had proper tools that they could utilize to do the screenings, and also encouraged them to make sure that the children were properly referred to the services uh, that were needed. Just for a little bit of perspective, and it's already been alluded to, those first few years of the ch child's life is is incredibly important as far as their potential to learn because those first three years is where we are really laying down the foundation or laying the foundation for which the child will learn for the rest of their lives. So if that child is in an environment where it is not supportive of brain growth, guess what? That foundation is gonna be very weak. If he's in an environment where is he's fully supported, you have a strong foundation and the point that I'm trying to make is that if that foundation is weak and you get that child a little bit later, you can remodel, you can help him out, you know, you can improve his potential, but you'll never maximize the potential that was there if that foundation was strong from the beginning. So again, the first thing that we tried to do was to make sure that uh, all of our children were uh, being properly screened for any developmental um, challenges because we know if we, we identify them early, get the child in the proper services, then we're going to improve the potential the child has when he gets to you. So that was the first uh, thing that we uh, were charged to do. Secondly, we want we recognize that even if we identify these children with developmental problems, that there was a lack of uh, services out there to actually remediate and build these children. So uh, the second thing we did was to actually start a fellowship program within our hospital where we brought in uh, PT, OT, speech. Um, uh, we had uh, social work counselors, you know, lots of service providers. And we brought them in and made sure that, you know, trying to improve or increase the workforce, train them in helping to identify and treat children with developmental problems. And lastly, a third part of what we try to do is to directly impact the families 
and that we try to make sure that healthcare providers and community agencies, people in general, uh, would share with families certs, uh, developmental health promotion activities that would encourage the families to increase their reading with the children, the singing with the children, the talking with the children. And, you know, and basically this improves that nurturing environment, environment that we talk about in, from which the child can uh, learn and develop a lot more. So again, we took different approaches and together kind of spread our message across the state in an effort to bring everybody to the table so that we can improve the um, de developmental and behavior health of all the children in Mississippi. Thank you. That actually kind of reminds me um, about the level of interest we have um, this past legislative session in early interventions. And so I'm very curious to see, we have really strong legislative champions around early interventions right now. So I'm very curious to see where we'll go, especially since you enunciate or enumerating how far we've already come. Um, these questions are for everyone. So I don't want to say free for all, but <laughs> okay. So how does early learning contribute to longer term success and more specifically early elementary level success? And we've kind of um, talked about that already, but if we could say a little more. So my quick comment is to read. No, back. you go ahead, Dr. Patterson. Go ahead. <laughs> so my quick comment is that that foundation is built uh, from birth to three and everything else builds upon that foundation. So that's the reason we are trying to emphasize what we do for the uh, children in the first few years of life are critical to their potential of what they'll do for the rest of their lives. And I'll just add on to that with, I'm sorry, Jeanette. Um, I'll add on to that with um, some of the things, you know, when we think about pre-K, we think about the whole child, you know, those are the, that four-year-old four year old year is prime for executive functioning skills and trying to teach those skills and making sure that children are able to operate in the kindergarten classroom with success with their teachers and their peers. And so we really uh, try to focus on um, making sure that those children are ready um, and successful for their whole entire school career. And we believe that those are, those are key skills that they need to exit pre-K year with. I think you're muted again. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't think I was. Uh, might I add that oral language comprehension, um, language comprehension, um, that's a key component, the only biologically driven component um, in the simple view of reading uh, that's needed um, to help uh, a kiddo reach that reading comprehension by the end of third grade. So you have de decoding, of the words, the phonic, the phonemic awareness, and that oral language, the oral um, language development, those times, one times the other equals reading comprehension. Without one, that oral language um, development is a huge component of a kid learning to read. If they don't know, they don't understand the what's being, the, the vocabulary that's being used, um, it makes it almost impossible to reach that outcome of reading comprehension. So again, that starts early. That starts with talking to a, a, a baby at birth, you know, con using the, the vocabulary that you expect them to see as they, you know, as they're, you're, they're growing up instead of calling it, you know, oh, go get, go get the, the you know, pin pin or go get a pen, you know, using the correct verbiage along with um, uh, that, interaction, having kids speak to you and having, uh, talking to them as you're going through the store, as you're going on a trip, that plays an important part um, in acquiring those necessary skills to access reading comprehension. Yeah, I'll second that on the vocabulary. That's one of the things that we see as a true deficit. Um, many times when children come into the pre-K classroom is they may not understand what words mean, but they will before the end of the school year. <laughs> right. Great. And we've seen a lot of, I mean, even this panel is, um, I think, a hallmark of collaboration and how collaboration is so important. 
um, especially in early childhood, because things have a tendency. Some people want to put things in health buckets and then some people want to put things in education buckets. But we know, as Dr. Patterson said earlier, these are things that have to happen in dialogue with each other. Um, and so each of you has mentioned collaboration. I think I've even mentioned collaboration as being a key contributing factor to how we've gotten where we've gotten. Um, so I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on the importance of collaboration and how it manifests in your work. So for the early learning collaboratives, you know, they have to cooperate. And the, one of the things that we say to them is, you know, it's not about the problems with the money. The money's not the challenge. It's the relationships. And it's kind of like a marriage. You've got to work at it. And it just doesn't happen automatically. Um, you know, and we have to work at it at the state level, too. Tanette and I, uh, Dr. Smith and I work very closely together. We may have differing opinions about things, but we move past it and try to find a solution. Um, and so there are other advocates, other, um, you know, leaders in early childhood that we approach that have, you know, differing opinions and, and we just try to work around it. But the key is, to me, the key is continuing those conversations. I agree, Dr. Jill. Uh, it's it's about breaking down those silos and not letting the ego, the adult ego, get in the way of providing services and supports for our kids in Mississippi. And so I think Jill and I have done a great job of of agreeing to disagree on certain things, right? And yeah, we try. <laughs> we try and we move beyond and we we're open and willing to make compromises because that compromise is going to get us to the end result. And that end result is student outcomes, right? Increasing our student outcomes and ensuring that our kiddos are becoming productive citizens, able to function in Mississippi and be parents and part of the community. Mm -hmm. Recognize some of the same challenges as we try to bring uh, medical services to the children with you know developmental needs meaning we had the uh, practitioners in one corner and we had the therapists in another corner and we had parents in another corner. And actually uh, we came together and developed what we called an early childhood development coalition. So a central part of this, our parents, our parents came to the table and tell, to tell us, what are the real issues? What are the real barriers? You, you know, you may see me in my office, but what does it take to actually get to the therapists and get the services done. So within this coalition were healthcare providers or they were parents. There were community advocacy groups uh, that offered a lot of support, you know, to the families. Uh, we learned things like, even though I may have written, a, made the diagnosis, actually getting the message to the family getting the appointment set up, getting the family in the practice to get the, so th these were all, you know, little barriers that some of us weren't even aware of. So as this collaborative coalition, and I love uh, Dr. Tanette said, we broke down some of those silos and we began to talk to each other so that we could as a group discover what the issues were before we could begin to address it. So we actually, developed a coalition, an ongoing coalition to try to continue to address some of these issues. I think that's great. Jill, oh, oh, go, Jill, go in, the, in, in the webinar chat, someone asked, how do we resolve our disagreements? Um, just constant conversation. We keep the lines of communication open and honest. Um, we have a saying, um, clear is kind. And so, yeah. you know, that frank, courageous conversation um, that we have, you know, I'm wrong at times and I would, I can admit it. Jill, you know, has retracted. So we know that there is a give and take and there's no, you know, we're not going to stand in cement shoes to the detriment of our state or our children. Yeah. And, and that's the first thing that we both ask each other and ourselves is, is this best for the child? You know, with that is our first and foremost question all of the time. And then um, the other question is, is it better for the child or the adult in the right. situation? And so, um, you know, I mean, you, it it's hard sometimes, but we just keep on talking and we 
get through it. We try to find a happy medium and and figure out a way to try to um, get to a point where, you know, it's good for both sides or at least the best for both sides. Right. Dr. Patterson, I wasn't sure if you were going to jump in, but um, I am going to go ahead and transition us to another question. But I think something that I noticed as y'all were talking is that the common theme seems to be that collaboration is a contact sport and that you have to continue. <laughs> you have to continue every day, no matter how hard it is. Um, and I appreciate the willingness to do that because as y'all said, it's for the best of the kids. Um, and Dr. Patterson said something, Dr. Patterson said something about um, parents and families and how that's an important um, collaborator. And I think sometimes there is an urge to forget the families and the parents in this. Um, and I think that early childhood, I think does a little bit, but I am used to be a teacher, first grade and fourth grade. So I think that early childhood does a better job of this, quite frankly, um, of keeping parents in the loop. And so parent and family engagement is such a key component of early childhood. Um, and so in what ways are families being engaged to support early early childhood and student success? So um, go ahead, Dr. Patterson. You hadn't said anything in a minute, so I'll hush. <laughs> so, uh, we truly recognize that the parents are the first educators, you know, for our children. And it's not necessarily in a formal way. Let me give you an example. You know, one of the developmental health promotion activities that we um, supported and encouraged was a reading program where providers introduce a book in their practice and the parents take it home and read to the child at home. What we recognized was that if a healthcare provider, and I know you educators, you know, that's your role, but somehow if that provider says that reading is a part of this child's health, it encourages the family to go home and read. But even if that family member is not a strong reader, what we try to um, underscore is it's really their re relationship. It's that nurturing, it's um, building that child up and giving them confidence. So if you can't read every word on the page, create your own story. It's about spending that time and affirming the child. So the parent is a very much a part of the learning process. And the other thing that we recognize, it does not matter how much we want to do for the child if we don't in some way empower the family to be able to follow through on that. So that's part of, you know, our discovery is recognizing that quite often that family needs that coordinator person to help them figure out how to get off work or how to get the child to whatever the, the needed visit is. So again, the parents or that caregiver sometimes a grandparent is a very critical part of the situation. In, in our early childhood policies, we um, do traditional things. We have um, the transition folder from pre-K to K, you know, that's typical of most entities. Um, but we also have these family and family teacher conferences twice a year that's in our policies. Um, and we also provide um, support from our team to districts and providers for family engagement efforts. We have a consorted um, unit for family engagement. So we have a, a leader as well as coaches that provide districts and our early learning collaboratives and other um, our other pre-K programs, um, some support services there to help them with their family engagement efforts on the local level. Uh, Jill, um, that's right. And and as a part of the Literacy-Based Promotion Act, uh, within the law, within the statute itself, um, there's language that says that this is not just the onus of the MDE, the LEA, the local education agency, or the school or the, the teacher, this is a partnership between the school, the district, and the parent. And the parents are um, a, a vital, a key component of the legislation. Within the confines of the Literacy-Based Promotion Act, um, there's language that says that we have to provide uh, parent um, read at home plans or strategies to assist parents with their students who are struggling with learning to read. We have uh, districts must, um, notify parents 
as soon as a reading deficit is identified as early as kindergarten. And kindergarten parents will receive a note that says, you know, your child is struggling with some of the key skills needed to be a proficient reader. They may be retained in third grade if these deficit areas are not remediated or not closed. And so it, it's the parent is a key component. We also recognize very early on, um, we you do have to get the parent buy-in, the community buy-in for any initiative that you roll out. Um, at the in, the onset of the LBPA, we had so many naysayers, we had so many um, uh, activist groups that were very, very vocal in saying that this law was meant to retain poor black students in the state period. And, you know, we had to do a very big communications push out to those parents and just really ask them. The, the one question we asked every parent was, do you want your child to know how to read by the time they leave third grade? What parent is going to say no, right? Every parent is going to answer that with an affirmative, right? And so we just, we made sure we, and we keep that up now. We still provide parent um, family nights. We we provide parent access um, to our Mississippi um, public broadcasting. We have a website with on Education TV where early childhood and elementary ed develop these wonderful resources for parents to access um, via YouTube. So you know we're we're always figuring out at multiple ways to get to a parent because sometimes they can't get to that parent night where we're providing the resources. But you know here's here it is on. YouTube that you can get to. We know people usually will look at a YouTube video on their their phone. So we we're, we're looking always looking for ways to engage parents. Yeah, that's uh, great. Oh. Joe, go ahead. No, I was just going to say we have um, a resource to share um, with the rest of the resources that's on our website about family engagement activities, um, as well as um, the public broadcasting videos and different things. And so I think they're going to share that soon so mm -hmm. um this is great and it's really awesome to hear about so much great work happening with families especially from dr smith um, i really love hearing that um so dr smith what supports exist for teachers and students that have also made this long-term success possible well i think it's important to recognize that when we started this initiative um we did it we surveyed the landscape and um this legislatures that we want 75 coaches to be ready to go out and, and support teachers and help our kids get where they need to be. Well, once they surveyed the landscape and they, they um, interviewed over 600 people for these positions, they were only able to identify 22 who really could identify, name, and provide a strategy for improving the, um, the pillars of reading. So they you know, only 22 people can name the five pillars of reading. So that told us, and that included IHL professors, principals, teachers, that really told us that we needed to do some, some level setting. And mm -hmm. so we really looked at um, providing uh, professional learning opportunities um, through the procurement of a K-3 um, PD series. Um, so that that was grounded and based in the, the, decades of research around the science of reading, how kids acquire reading skills. Um, so we provided that um, to support our teachers. Then in turn, um, in addition, we also deployed literacy coaches. We started out again, like I said, with 22 um, literacy coaches and they went out and they worked with teachers side by side. And this was non-evaluative. We weren't there as how can I put this professionally? We weren't there as snitches on the on behalf of the Department of Education. We were there to really provide support to teachers. And so we build those relationships um, with our teachers and then built the relationship, help them build relationships with their students and show them how to build relationships with their parents in, in turn. Um, so those supports, that coaching support and the professional learning what were key pillars to supporting and increasing student outcomes and student um, understanding as well as 
teacher capacity, building teacher capacity. Um, we looked through our what we were doing at the department as a whole, and we found that there were many ways that we could col collaborate internally to make sure that we were supporting teachers. Um, so we we worked with the Office of Special Ed, and they provided um, wrote a grant for the state systemic improvement plan, um, which is our ESIP coaches. And so it was modeled after our LBPA, but the focus was supposed to be four through eight. Um, we looked at um, providing professional learning um, for inclusion teachers um, and special ed um, teachers that so they could attend those trainings that we were providing. providing. And then we were looking at supporting our educator prep programs to sort of support those incoming novice teachers. Um, these are all strategies to ensure long-term success because you start looking at your pre-service teachers who are coming out and helping them acclimate to a um, a smoother, make a smoother acclimate, um, acclimate smoother to, to, to their classrooms. They're less likely to leave the profession after two years um, because that's the trend that we had been seeing between two and three years, teachers, new teachers were burned out. And it was never about uh, the kid. Um, it was about the type of paperwork, the un, um, the expectation of um, uh, a lack of support from the administrators. So we, we, we massaged and supported all of that to ensure that we were addressing the kiddos deficit area by providing teachers with strategies and an understanding about how to address those deficit areas. I'm an old pre-K teacher. I had a, a early childhood center, uh, birth to age five. And so I I know the importance of, um, I know what I didn't know and now I do, do know. So if I know what I know now, <laughs> I would have been a phenomenal teacher, you know, <laughs> but unfortunately at the time that was not part of our, our pre-service um, model. And so I had to teach myself and, you know, we want to get away from that. We want to provide people with opportunities to learn prior to, or when they get in there, provide them with opportunities to learn. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Dent, I think this next question kind of relates um, to what Dr. Smith was saying. So another challenge to ensuring quality uh, in education professional in education professionals um, our materials and curriculum um, and resources. So how does quality control happen sort of within the system um, from more of like a pre-K perspective? So earlier I mentioned um, the near benchmarks um, and that's the National Institute for Early Education Research. Uh, for years now, we have met 10 of those 10 benchmarks, which we are very proud of. Um, we are one in five states in the nation that meet those. Um, and one of those components is um, ensuring quality. Um, you know, we um, do that with monitoring our programs every year. We go into every single classroom every single year um, for monitoring purposes. We also provide coaching for those teachers. Um, every year, all year, we provide those services. Um, we conduct a class observation in those in those um, classrooms and help those teachers. We use class as it was intended to be used as a professional learning model. Um, we go in, our coaches go in and see what's going on. And then we build a professional learning plan based on that observation. And so, um, you know, we try to help those teachers uh, become more skilled throughout the year with their instruction practices um, and their in, um, interaction practices within, within the classroom. Um, we also conduct assessments with the children. You know, we use for dance, screen three as our whole child assessment. And we also use the kindergarten readiness assessment as well. And so these are all components with the co coaching support for the teachers and for the administrators and the program leads. You know, we are also there to, um, you know, we're there to be the paramedic, not the police. You know, um, we help and support our teachers and our program leaders. 
Uh, we provide them with any kind of support system they need, whether it's training or just a listening ear, um, you know, and um, different viewpoints. We find out that, that sometimes when they're struggling with a certain situation, they're stuck in the world and having a conversation with somebody on the outside helps um, take into different perspectives that may be, you know, there, there's other options to solve the problem. And so, you know, in all of that together um, with the curriculum as well, you know, in the near benchmarks, there's certain components with the near, with the um, curriculum supports. Um, we um, have moved to Mississippi Beginnings, which is a derivative from the focus on pre-K through Boston Public Schools. And um, we're supporting that because it's um, shown child outcome evidence-based. And so we're very intentional about ensuring that these classrooms are delivering high quality instruction in their classroom on a daily basis. And so um, that intentionality is not, um, it's not a miracle and it's not a, not a happenstance. <laughs> it's very intentional. Absolutely. Dr. Patterson, um, we just heard a lot about quality controls, um, and I think we're going to pivot back to partnership. So what are some of the key partnerships that have developed, and how do those partnerships work as early childhood efforts, um, especially since you're at the younger end of the spectrum, typically? Um, yeah, so we um have recognized that although there is a system in place in the state of Mississippi to try to address um, uh, young children with developmental uh, problems, it has not worked efficiently uh, for our children. And so um, one thing that we're doing now, Dr. Buttress, who's been kind of the lead of our team and she's a developmental specialist, she is now leading um, an early intervention task force. Now, why is this so important for us? Number one, I bet the educators on this call hadn't quite recognized how there is definitely an increase in the number of kids that we're seeing these days with significant developmental issues. There are lots more. We, we can't quite define why there are so many more. Is it environmental? We don't know. But the fact is there are more kids that are out there that are in need of services. So uh, one thing that she has taken on is to uh, be the leader of a task force where we are pulling leaders. So, you know, I've worked more in the weeds, you know, those on the ground, seeing the kids and what we need to do in the offices. We need to elevate it because as we identify so many more of these kids, we need to do a better job of providing the services that they need to maximize their potential. So on a, a higher level, uh, this task force has pulled together um, state you know, department leadership and uh, leading educators and um, you know, leaders of therapists groups out there so that we can really uh, come to the table and figure out how do we better serve these kids? Because, you know, and I recognize that you're not talking about kids who are a little bit speech delayed. We're talking about children who have more major, have major developmental challenges. And what we're trying to do is before they show up in your classroom, that we've provided them all the service to maximize whatever potential um, that they have there. So we're taking the initiative to try to revisit and revamp the system that we would need to support these children uh, once we identify them. Again, to max, and it's amazing if you identify them early, if you get them into the right services, if you have the right service providers, you'll be amazed at how much better these children will perform. So we're just trying on a higher level to improve our system so that we can um, you know, give every child in the state the best advantage. That is a perfect segue into the next question about alignment between 
zero to three and four to eight, which I think of as, I think of zero to eight as early childhood. So how, ha, what work has been um, happening there to sort of align all of these efforts? Um, you mentioned the early interventions task force, um, which I think is beginning to kind of tackle that. Um, but I'm curious what else is happening to sort of align these big, um, sometimes disparate um, areas of childhood. Our educators, meaning we would love that's for our, biggest dream. <laughs> our <laughs> biggest dream would be that there would be a child center, that any child who walks in the door and we identify whatever that need is within that system, it could be addressed. That's a big dream. Right now, we're taking it one step at a time. If we can at least have a system that you know remediates these kids, we think that'll be the first step. So I'm going to yield to our educators. <laughs> I just wanted to add that a few years ago, we recognized that um, we did not have as much vertical alignment in our early learning standards as we needed to. And um, so we took on um, creating the infant and toddler standards and aligned those to our three and four year old standards. So now our standards go and are vertically aligned from birth all the way through 12th grade. Um, we did that in about 2018. And we also um, add on uh, to that is our, um, our checklist for our teachers and for our standards so that they can go in and grab those and be able to have those and, and reference those throughout the year. But we also have way um, some information on our website about, you know, how it is, uh, how a parent would interpret those standards and what that looks like. Um, because we recognize that parents, you know, there's education jargon. And so parents may not understand everything that what we mean by certain terminology. And so we really try to, you know, bring that down to a, a family level, no matter where that family is. Um, and so I think that alignment, especially with the standards and then resources for teachers with those standards and resources for families was really important at that time. I, I, I agree, um, Jill. We, in addition, you know, the resources that we developed, were, we were always looking at how to make it more parent friendly. We have a family guide for student success that look, literally looked at standards that were filled with um, verbiage that some educators may have had difficulty with. And um, we broke it down to make it more parent-friendly parent and gave them activities to use to help address a particular um, area, skill, um, or standard. Um, I'd also like, I'd be remiss to say that um, we've worked very hard with several of our our partners uh, to develop a K, a, a birth to 12th grade literacy um, plan. And so it really looks at, and Dr. Dent um, and her um, crew were a part of this plan through the, our Region 7 Comprehensive Center. Um, and it really looks at um, the full continuum from birth all the way up at, to as they matriculate and exit out of um, high school and what parents, what teachers, the community, education, educator prep. So it, it's multi-layered looking at those big buckets of, of uh, supports, um, but not leaving out um, some of those wraparound services that are embedded within the, the community. That's great. I um, actually have a question that's completely off script, but <laughs> some of the things that I have seen um, just in my work, um, I, especially working with Jill, I've seen that um, focus on pre-K, the curriculum from Boston, that it's not just a curriculum, it's actually like an entire program of aligning, I think, pre-K three for them all the way through second grade. And so I'm curious, is there other talks about that? Like, what is that something that y'all be interested in, in terms of making sure that um, things are developmentally appropriate for a child in terms of like what a classroom looks looks like because there's a huge gap between pre-k and kindergarten there there is a huge gap between pre-k and kindergarten um at this moment we are um 
we recognize that in order to continue our upward trajectory, that we still have to continue to, to um, focus and support our early childhood, but we also have to look at some of the high quality instructional material that are being used within the classrooms. Um, grades kindergarten through 12th are ruled by a state statute that requires the, the Mississippi Department of Education to review any instructional material submitted and requested by, you know, from a vendor. Um, unfortunately, open educational resources are not part of those um, resources that we can vet. So K through 12, we're looking at um, material that's submit, submitted by a vendor and then we take that material um, and we have a committee of teachers and experts in that particular content area to review it for its, um, number one, its alignment to our Mississippi College and Career Readiness Standards, um, number two, to the text complexity and the um, uh, actual material that, you know, that's included within it. And the third gateway would be to look at the um, professional development, the assessment, the usability of it, you know, is it easy to use? Um, look at all of, all of those components as a key. If a, if a um, vendor does not make it through gateway one, which looks at that, um, the foundational skills K through two, they don't make it to gateway two. So we, we won't even look at them to, to use um, as an HQIM. We are, that is our big push because we know that we do have teachers who are coming in who um, may not have the content knowledge necessary to provide quality opportunities for children to learn. Our HQIM for kindergarten, we make sure that it it's, it's, uh, includes developmentally appropriate practices that are, that, you know, that include center time, um, that include um, opportunities to uh, reenact um, uh, stories that they've read. Um, at the same time, we're also looking at the acquisition of those phonemic awareness, phonological awareness skills that are important, just the hearing the sounds that are important as a kiddo progresses from K to one and the phonics skill as they matriculate and get to, into the latter part of kindergarten, they should be connecting those PA skills, what they hear to the phonics skills. And that's why you see those little string of letters. You know, when a kid starts to write, you'll see them making strings of letters that don't have any connection. And then towards the, towards the end of kindergarten, because they have the PA, they're starting to make these strings of letters that may be the beginning sound and ending sound of a word. And so now we can see that developmental progression of learning to read and can use that to transfer into uh, kindergarten as well as to first grade. Thank you. Um, I have one more question that's also off script and this is more so for Dr. Dent and Dr. Patterson. Um, Dr. Patterson, you kind of gave us your greatest wish list, <laughs> which I love to hear. Um, it might may or may not be on mine as well, but. I'm curious about the alignment, especially with the new preschool development grant that Mississippi just got, the alignment that's gonna happen between zero to four in particular. Expertise is identifying these children, getting them into the services, making sure that we've maximized whatever potential is there and then placing them in an appropriate educational system. So we, you know, let me also mention, we also recognize that because we have so many children who are already within the school system who have unmet developmental needs, part of what we're doing is also engaging preschool teachers as well as, you know, um, elementary, middle, age um, middle school teachers and they we have a platform it's a video platform that we get together it's kind of led by Dr. Butchers and some other developmental specialists and if the teacher has a particular concern about a student they can present that concern on this platform and even short of getting that child into you know the office 
we can advise that teacher on some ways to manage that child, you know, in the classroom setting. So again, um, our effort is mostly to make sure we are identifying these kids and getting them into services, but also until we have that more perfect system, walking mm -hmm. with some of the educators and advising them on what they can do. Thank you, more perfect system, okay. Um, so one of the things with the PDG grant we're trying to reach in with, um, we are going to uh, provide more support uh, or additional support to child care center pre-K teachers um, and be able to support them the way that we support our um, collaborative teachers um, and try to um, you know, to be able to prepare them and get them ready if they're interested in becoming a collaborative. And that'll help set up, um, you know, for that program to be more prepared and approach, you know, the school district and the community partners. Um, the other thing that, you know, with that, we want um, to try to help We've got family engagement activities within that um, program and as well as um, blended grants that we will offer to school districts to offer classrooms where there are children that um, are would typically be in a general ed setting as well as a special education um, setting with those children with IEPs so that they can learn from each other. Um, that is one component. Um, and so there, there's many of professional learning components to that, as well as conferences and ways to support teachers um, and administrators on what appropriate practice looks like. Um, and so we are just getting started on that grant. And so we're really um, ready to go. Thank you. It's great to hear all the alignment and work that's happening right now. Um, and as we look to the future, I guess, what do each of you, what would you like to see? And I think Dr. Patterson has answered this question, but what would you like to see in each of the respective spheres we've covered today? Early years in health, pre-K, and then K th and then K through three. So one of the things that I think um, that we've done to be able to ensure access to high quality um, is consistent leadership. I mean, you hear about turnover, especially at the state level and local level all of the time. Um, and Dr. Smith and I have been here from the very beginning um, and we've just been in cubicles next to each other, um, you know, and. So I really do think it's not necessarily what the two of us have done, but that we've done it together and we've been here from the beginning. Um, not many states can say that they've had staff members on for eight to 10 years. I mean, and, you know, um, in, in leadership roles like ours. Um, I'm not saying nobody else did, but there's just not many, you know, we um, are very committed. Um, and I think that consistency is one of the factors that have contributed to the um, force of going forward. Um, because there's, if somebody came in to, to, you know, to pick up where we left off, how much time would there be for, you know, growth and learning the program and then, how long would it have stalled because of that? And so, you know, I, I really do think, I feel strongly about that, that, you know, that consistent leadership is um, is key. Jill, I, I can concur. Um, the, the consistency um, and the institutional knowledge that you bring, you talk, you can talk about pre-K um, like it's, you know, from the top of your head because it's part of you. Um, literacy and the, the programming, you know, Dr. Kimiana Burke and I, we wrote the 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 script, so to speak, for the um how we were how we would provide coaching supports to our schools in our districts and the additional professional learning that would be needed. So I, I agree. Um, what I hope to see 
us or the state do is to continue its upward trajectory to con but also to and I'm going to make this plea right now you know I'd love to see more funding for grades four through eight to um, support not only literacy acquisition but also math um, acquisition um, our math scores are sort of weak once we hit fourth and through eighth grade and you know, why is that? What can we do to support that learning um, so that our children, you know, are able to access that material? So the consistent leadership, the consistency with leadership, um, having a way to sort of um, capture, Jill, your and my institutional knowledge so that if we don't, if we aren't here, someone can be able to pick it up and um, move forward with it. Um, and then building a cadre of people who are, you know, you're building leaders internally. I'm constantly looking at who is ready for the next step, who is, can take on another piece of, um, a piece, another role. Um, one of the questions was in the, the chat, ask about our, our sh sh staff shortage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, we are seriously, there are very few people working, doing a lot of jobs. Um, and we do what we can do. Um, we do it with grace and mercy because um, there are only so many hours in a day. And I am really trying to get Jill and my staff um, to really understand that you need to take care of yourself too in order to do something for someone else. So I, I hope that we are getting a better work-life balance. I hope that we have some consistency and um, I see us hopefully getting more investment in our uh, grades four through eight literacy initiatives and math um, initiatives. And so one of the ways that in early childhood in our office that we um, help our staff grow is um, we give away Legos. So <laughs> <laughs> we give away Legos. Uh, that means like um, we give away tasks. You know, as leaders, we just absorb what others can't take on. And so I know that I've had to um, come to the realization that I cannot do it all. And so um, giving away some of those Legos and then standing back and and letting other people accomplish the task without, um, I'm, I'm not a micromanager, but making sure that it's right for the program. Um, and so that's been um, the thing that we've been able to do is try to give away our Legos, so. Like that, give away your Legos. Dr. Patterson, do you have anything? So my only comment would be that um, my desire for every child is whether you live in a major city or in the smallest community, that um, you can access whatever you need mm -hmm. um, to grow into your best person. And what you need means that you have access to it, that you have um, professionals that are trained as child, you know, providers, so that you're getting not just a service, but the service that is specifically designed to fit what your needs are, and that this system does not depend on where you are or who you are or what area of the state, that it would be something that's available to every child in the state. Yes, it's a beautiful vision. I think we can all agree with that one for sure. Um, I'm going to go ahead and transition us to question Q&A, Q but I wanted to say thank you um, to each of you. I feel like I, I was taking notes as y'all were talking. I was like, oh, this is a great experience. I was a little nervous, but thank y'all. Um, and so now we're going to switch to some questions and I'm going to just, um, it was a first come first serve. So I'm just going to read them and then um, say who they're for. So the first one is for Dr. Dent slash Dr. Patterson. Um, and I'm not sure who said this, so I'm sorry, but um, does funding support comprehensive services for children and their families, similar to the way that Early Head Start does for infants and toddlers? So the, pro 
one of the problems we've seen is that because uh, a lot of the kids are not formally going through the early intervention program. I tell you, as a clinician, if I see a child in my office that I know has developmental needs, often I'm going to send them to the speech therapist that I know or the physical therapist that I know, and they don't necessarily go through that formal early intervention system because we've had challenges with them getting in, getting referred on. So we don't capture that that child needs to service. So the funding for EI is di directly tied to how many kids they serve, yet we all know there are lots of kids that are not being served through the system. So yes, the funding should be comparable to the number of kids and the service they need, but since it's been less than perfect, a lot of us have circumvented that system and tried to at least get the child in to some services. Um. I think the question also was for um, Dr. Dent. I don't know if you want to talk about pre-K funding and how that sort of works as well. So comprehensive uh, services. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, with our early learning collaborative, um, we encourage our programs to be inclusive. Um, we really try to make sure that um, they include children with um, in their most appropriate setting. Uh, to be included in those classrooms in the general education classroom within the collaborative. Um, those classrooms still operate the same way, um, but if that's the appropriate setting for those children, we strongly encourage it. Um, and we work with our districts and our programs to be able to make that happen. So if we see something um, where those children could be included, we work with that program to make sure that that happens. Um, the other thing about that is, you know, with our with our Head Start partners, we really try to um, be supportive with them as well because they offer additional services that maybe the school district can't offer or, you know, in some cases, and they are able to offer um, more parental support as well. And so we really try to um, work with them. We, we've been working... Um, on an idea of dual enrollment within the public schools where those children would also be enrolled in Head Start um, to be able to receive additional services and supports. And so, you know, we we really work with our, our programs. We have, um, they have to do screenings with the children. And then if they're, of course, if there's problems identified, we support them in obtaining those screenings for those children. We've we've had some children that um, were identified with dental issues, and you know, of course, these that this particular child had lots of challenging behaviors. But the reason that the child was so abrupt in the classroom was because he was in pain all the time. And so, once that child was identified. Um, the collaborative was able to go out and obtain the services that that child needed to help him, him, her. And, you know, the same thing with vision, you know, that that's something that we see on a regular basis. Every once in a while, we'll hear about lead um, and lead poisoning. And so I just think that, you know, it goes back around to that whole child initiative. You know, we, we try to make sure that we're addressing, um, all of the developmental need, domains and all of the needs of the child and the family as much as possible. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is for Dr. Smith slash Dr. Dent. Were there any reading um, or learning resources provided to the fam to the parents and families at home that contributed to this miracle? Air quotes miracle. <laughs> I mean, we named a couple, a few of the um, um, parent supports and, and resources that we provided. But Jill, I think I would be remiss to say that any one or single one of them um, had, you know, total impact on it. I think it was the use of multiple mm -hmm. um, resources, not a, you know, not a single one, because I don't think any single resource could meet the needs of a parent. Um, our strong readers, strong, strong leaders, strong readers, Mississippi um, 
uh, website morphed. Uh, in the beginning, the um, the website consisted of just strictly um, activities and the parent had to read it. And so we recognized very early on, okay, what if we had a parent who struggled with reading themselves? Um, and so we needed to provide access or ways for parents to access the information that you know, would help them also increase their literacy outcomes, their literacy skills. And so we we changed the activities from a reading, you know, something you had to read or, or follow step by step to a short video um, that walked them through how to do a particular, uh, address a particular standard. So, I mean, we've come a long way in our thinking, but it, it again, um, I was talking to one of my staff, we're always proactive so that we don't have to be reactive. And you know, we're we're constantly looking to, you know, two years down the road instead of looking at this year and next year, because, you know, we we know that shifting demographics, shifting population, um, you know, shifting priorities, you know, depending on leadership. We're right now, you know, we're we have an interim state superintendent. And so we don't know what the new superintendents, state superintendents whoever they name or, or identify, we don't know what their priority will be. And so if we are we continue to work and we plan two years down the road, we know we know we at least have that in place and are ready to, you know, continue to work. Well, and I know that the the pandemic was a challenge for everyone, but it also gave us um, a minute to stop and think about, you know, since children were at home and not in classrooms, um, ways to reach out um, to the children and families. Um, and that's where those videos came from. We um, yeah. videotaped, gosh, I know, 30 or 40 episodes um, that's mm -hmm. published on um, public broadcasting and on our website um, just for families, for them to, right. you know, to work with their children while they were at home. And we created the, um, family engagement activities that's on our back to school resource page. And um, we've got our splash pages up there and just different things. We were thinking about, you know, especially with our family engagement, uh, uh, family engagement activities. Those were activities that were aligned to the standards and we identified the standards, but we also ensured that those were activities that, um, that family uh, items that families had at home. Yeah. It wasn't Correct. something you could go buy. It, mm -hmm. Some of them have um, materials of rocks and sticks and different things or mm -hmm. um, counting utensils or sorting utensils or just different things that they would have at home that they could, could continue that learning. So I think that it's not necessarily one document or mm -hmm. one publication or one series of things, but it's it, the foundation of our mm -hmm. resources are all the same. Um, they're all built on the standards. And then we go from there in different variations of um, ways to reach parents or ways to, re ways to reach teachers or ways to help the children. Yep. I'm giving you two snaps. Great. Thank you. <laughs> This next question is for Dr. Patterson. Um, what specifically has been done to slash for parents of infants and toddlers to encourage talk, singing, talking, singing, and reading? Um, excellent question. Because, uh, you know, as opposed to a formal educational setting, we're saying any moment that you spend with your child, just hearing your voice, even before they have language, you know, they're hearing the voice, they're, uh, you know, hearing words, uh, beginning to assimilate words. So, of course, two things that we specifically encourage was our reading program, any book, any size, any words, just engaging the child uh, in that way. And uh, to piggyback on um, what Dr. Dan and Dr. Smith were saying, we also encourage them to take everyday moments to teach the child. If you're walking through the grocery store, help count the tiles between the aisles. You know, you're teaching them numeracy. So there are simple ways, simple things that you can do to engage the child. And I do want to underscore, it's that relationship. It's just not the numbers that you give them, 
or the words. It's just embracing that child and spending that time with the child that builds their confidence. That's great, thank you. Um, this next question is for anyone. Are there any wraparound services provided to support families when issues related to, pro to poverty, trauma, or adverse childhood events um, that could possibly be related to the child's ability to learn given the neuroscience of learning? Sorry, I'm going to have to reread that to y'all. <laughs> okay. Are there any wraparound services provided to support families when issues related to poverty, trauma, ACEs, um, or, or anything that could sort of affect a child's ability to learn given the neural science of learning um, when these issues are, are present. So I guess, are there wraparound services that specifically address poverty, trauma, ACEs? So we've certainly partnered with some of the community agencies and I wanna specifically um, highlight Help Me Grow in Mississippi, it was Mississippi Families for Kids. So we partnered with them because if there's a family that has some of those social challenges, you know, um, um, food insecurity, housing issues, things like that, uh, then uh, they can contact these community agencies and they can offer support. Um, if there are issues with the school, there are agencies that can be advocates along with the family to go in and, you know, address the issues. So, Again, if there are specific medical issues, you know, we say bring them back to our office, but we know a lot, quite often, it's those community or social challenges um, that, you know, weary families the most. So Help Me Grow Mississippi is one agency that they can contact for that. And the other thing that I would say is, you know, we we work really closely with our Head Start partners in the state. Um, you know, that that's something that we're um, growing with. Uh, and so, you know, having having those dual enrolled classrooms gives those children additional services and supports through the Head Start system. Um, and it, it's additional services that the school can provide. And so we really um, are trying to grow that relationship much, much more in the state. Awesome. This next question is for Dr. Dent or Dr. Smith. Um, how have you improved teacher prep programs to ensure teachers are graduating with the necessary knowledge and skills to reduce the burden on districts to retrain teachers? That's a really good question. Yeah. So, go ahead, Tina. No, no, start, Jill, and I'll. Okay. Add. So, one of the things that we've done is we've really tried to work with our IHLs and our community colleges. We um, have started meeting with them on a quarterly basis so that we can make sure we have on a pathway for those guys to come up and, and be interested in early childhood um, before or before the collaboratives um, and before pre-K became such a thing. Um, a popular thing in Mississippi, um, there was question of whether or not the early childhood field was a viable field um, where you could get paid a, a working wage. And, you know, um, so through the years, we've worked to, um, for pay parity with our pre-K teachers making the same as our, our kindergarten and up teachers. Um, we have influenced policy there to um, make sure that that happens. We also have, um, with it, with that policy, have required that teachers, especially in the public school setting, obtain a license and so that they can obtain that pay. Um, you know, with the Collaborative Act, they have to have a bachelor's degree. And with, um, for a teacher and an assistant teacher, they have to have an associate's degree with, and both of those have to be specialized in early childhood. And so we were finding that we could find some people with, with those almost has had those requirements. And so we in early childhood went to our licensure commission and created um, what we called early childhood boot camp. And with that, um, that offers um, throughout that entire process that's about nine months, offers a free add-on endorsement to teachers that have a kindergarten license, they can add on pre-K to that at no charge. 
And so we, we've looked at several different ways of creating pathways for our teacher to expand our teacher pool. Um, and so it, it's, it's still a challenge. We're still struggling. Um, we're work, continuing to work with our IHLs and trying to figure out um, additional pathways and, and models to be able to um, expand the pool. Yeah. And in addition, as we look at um, pre-service um, teachers who are coming out with an endorsement in um, K through three, K five elementary education, as well as special education, we've added an, um, a, an assessment, um, early literacy assessment that they have to pass um, in order to receive their professional license. Um, so, And we also, um, in order to help them pass this assessment, we provide them with access to the same professional learning that we give our in-service teachers, our, our, our full teachers. Um, so they come out, they, they, they can go attend our um, AIMS Pathways for Proficient um, Readers or our AIMS pass, Pathways for uh, Literacy Leaders. Um, so they can attend those sessions, those training sessions that really delve deeply and dig into um, that research and the the um, pedagogy around teaching reading. Um, we are we also have started to look at the IHL uh, or um, certain schools syllabi uh, for their early literacy classes, early literacy one and early literacy two, to ensure they uh, have the components that are necessary to address, you know, what kids need or or the students need um, as they get ready to transition into a classroom. Um, we just recently, um, as in Thursday, recognized our first Science of Reading University, um, uh, Emerging Science of Reading University. So Jackson State received the first annual um, recognition um, for having um, First of all, engage their students in practicing, uh, ensuring that they attend those professional learning opportunities um, that our teachers are receiving, um, ensuring that they we pair them and match them with um, those pre-service teachers, pair them and match them with teachers who are using a high quality instructional material and helping them understand you know, how to use it. Um, they've changed their course syllabi when I was in school, and I'm sure uh, Michaela and Jill remember when we were in school and they asked us to do a lesson plan and they didn't give us any type of guidance on the lesson plan. And the lesson plan was just something that was just sitting out there, right? Yeah. Well, no longer do we have that. We don't want them doing that anymore. We want them looking at what the school district is using and using that to help develop their lesson plan based on the lesson that they will actually teach. So we're looking at um, really strengthening our relationship with our IHL um, partners and um, making sure that we're providing them with some support and guidance. Yes, thank you so much to all of you. I'm gonna turn it over um, to Hattie um, and let her close us out. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone joining us today for your questions in the chat and on the Q&A for your feedback to our panelists. It's been really wonderful to see how inspired everybody is and um, to hear you, see you echo back what you're hearing um, and, and what parts of today's conversation have resonated with you all individually. I'm also so grateful to all of our speakers for joining us to talk about this wonderful work um, that I think many of us will agree is a great model for other places. Um, and to our moderator, Michaela, thank you for taking us through this conversation. Very appreciative of it. Um, I think with that, we'll go ahead and, and, and close it out. Thanks everyone for joining today. And we'll be sending out follow-up resources um, later on this week with everything that was shared in the chat, as well as any other resources um, that didn't quite make it there, but that we have on file for you. Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.